So Wild Elephants um, is a project that came to me through my publisher. He said, what about elephants? I said, what about them? He said, we need to do a book. Do you have any photos? I've been tra traveling to Africa about 50 times. Yes, I think I've got some that we can use. And I recall the very first time I went to Africa, which was in November 1980. Back then, I had just gotten out of the University of Washington. I got really uh, uh, connected with the climbing community. And a couple of my friends said, let's go to Africa and climb Kilimanjaro. So in November of 1980, we did. We climbed Kilimanjaro, we had an extra week, and we went out into the Serengeti. And I really was just beginning my career with uh, photographing wildlife, and I really wanted to go out there in the Serengeti of Tanzania and see leopards. I wanted to see spots and stripes. So after climbing Kilimanjaro successfully, oh my God, I look so young. <laughs> look at that hat, oh my God. <laughs> so over the, uh, you know, we went out there in the Serengeti and yeah, leopards, cats, anything sexy, not big gray animals. That's really what I was after. You know, I, I grew up watching Walt Disney like many of you and how do you do a book on an animal that looks identical from very young and to very old and they're basically one color, which is gray? How do you fill a book, let alone a talk, about these creatures? And yeah, it was spotted animals, the, le uh, the leopards, the lions, the cheetahs, the zebras, anything with you know, design to them, not big gray animals. But the more I traveled, not only on that first trip to Tanzania, but on all the subsequent trips, I started to realize it was the elephants that had the personality, that had the behaviors. They were never boring. They were never just standing still like anticipated. And over the years, I've had many great encounters and continue. I'll be in Africa twice uh, later this year, and I just love going back but it's these charismatic, amazing animals that we're here today to talk about. And the more I looked at them, the more I, it's like they never are standing still. They're never just walking around. They're always engaging each other. They're in families. And uh, Sam, I'm sure, will be a little more uh, illustrative with his words than I am right now. So as a photographer, though, you're trying to employ every trick you can to make it a full book not just portraits of an animal, not just behavior, not just adults and babies, but everything you've learned to do over what have I done, Libby? How many books have I worked on over the years? Too many to even remember. But these elephants always have been part of other books. I've done books on Africa, books on behavior, books on camouflage, and I've even included elephants in those books on camouflage. Uh, this uh, photograph was taken in the Ngorogoro crater of Tanzania, and some of the largest elephants left in Africa with their amazing ivory are in this crater that's 12 miles across, and it's got this natural uh, border from which these elephants go up into the hillsides around, but they always come back down into this beautiful crater. And so seeing some of what used to be very common in Africa is amazing to see. The trunk has many, many muscles and they can uh, just maneuver it around. They use the elephant uh, trunk to communicate, to uh, touch each other, to uh, play with each other. And so the trunk becomes one of those elements of the animal that is first and foremost that I think about. And obviously they can reach up and grab branches. So a lot of this was shot over many of the countries in Africa. I've been over the years to about 21 different African countries, and most of those countries I've been do have populations of elephants. So this is in Amboseli at the foot of uh, Kilimanjaro, and there's just platoons of animals, uh, elephants that come down out of the forests on the lower slopes of Kilimanjaro. They come out uh, across the plains with a routine that you can predict. They come out to these water courses that 
the water collects at the base of this mountain. All the rain that, and snow that falls on the mountain just um, filters down into pools and canals in this uh, very arid environment. But that's what these elephants are moving towards with regularity. And that is something that I also should talk about, is that there's a predictability of elephants. They follow the same paths. And as I shot this shot and as they walked by, one thing also is really startling if you've never been around one, is the fact that you could have an entire herd of elephants walk past you and you cannot hear them, which is amazing to think about. They literally walk silently. Have you noticed that as well? Yeah, on their toes. Yeah, their, their pads and the distribution of weight on their very wide feet, they literally walk without sound. Which I've noticed when I've camped in the bush and looked out my tent to see a herd of elephants passing by. This was shot in Botswana in a dry river channel called Savuti. And at times, the, the, that channel is running with floodwaters. More times than not, it becomes very arid. The elephants dig holes into the sand and unearth the water, which provides nutrients and water for the other animals in the environment. And this is another case uh, of that. This is in Mashatu, which is a uh, preserve on the uh, southeast corner of Botswana. The elephants have dug holes into a dry riverbed a riverbed and water comes bubbling up and that provides water for the pride of lions which the elephants are now um, chasing away. So water is key. I mean when you find water you usually uh, wait around and elephants are going to show up. So as you see in the distance uh, with more elephants coming into this dry water hole in Mashatu they start to kick up the dust and envelop themselves in the dust and I often have said, the more my photos start to look like a painting, the happier I am. My background's actually, uh, I graduated from the University of Washington with degrees in painting and design. And so whenever I take a picture that looks more akin to a photo or a painting, the happy, happier I am. And so this is one of those shots taking advantage of the atmospheric conditions that the elephants they themselves have created. I'm happy with that shot. I'm very. Yeah, I mean, the elephants aren't aggressive towards other animals, but no animal really just sits there waiting for an elephant to walk right up to him. So everything kind of clears out. And the elephants are very confident uh, with that knowledge. The warthogs, the cranes. The other thing, water, of course, uh, dust. They love taking dust baths. It helps their skin. It cleans, uh, clears the flies away from their, their barren skin. And so dust is a part of uh, something that I drew for this book. And in Namibia, it's a very arid environment. And Etosha National Park has a few um, water holes, which attracts all animals, as you would guess. But it's the dusting that they love. So. That is part of what their trunks can do. And here a close-up shot of dust flying and bits of earth. The water at Chobe National Park in um, Zimbabwe and Botswana. So watching a, um, a family of elephants cross a, a fairly major river is pretty funny because if you're in a boat and you follow them or use the boat to go parallel with them, the little elephants can swim but the only way you, you see them is the trunks coming out of the water. <laughs> so when I, once I knew I was doing a book on elephants, uh, I traveled with a friend of mine from South Africa. We went to this uh, a reserve in southeast uh, Botswana, and this friend of mine is fairly uh, aggressive. He sunk a container, a metal container, and then dug a well and created a pool of water right in front of the container. And you can get in the container. He cut out an opening in the container. An elephant herd could walk literally over the top of you, and it's not going to crush you. So you're reasonably safe. The water is right in front of you. And with a wide-angle 
lens, we spent a, a couple of afternoons as herd after herd of elephants come in. And at that point, you put away your telephoto lens, you put on a wide angle, and everything's right in front of you. And the later the day uh, went, the more dramatic the light became. These elephants are very aware that we're there, and yet they are not fearing us, of course. They aren't necessarily happy that small creatures are close to them, but since they can't do anything about it, they just forget about you. And that is when the magic happens. That's when the behavior, the relationships between the elephants occur, all within just a few feet of you. So this is late in the whole game of doing the book that I had this amazing access with these amazing creatures. And of course, again, they know you're there, and yet they would put waves of muddy water towards you. And we were literally jumping out of the way as waves of water were coming in. By the time we left, that container had about 12 inches of muddy water. Our cameras, our cells were covered in mud, but we got the shots, and that's what's critical. And just having that kind of perspective and access to these wild elephants is a lifelong memory just to see how they love that. And again, this water, this pool, was man-made in a very arid environment. So it's a classic case where wild animals are being uh, taking advantage of somebody's idea and very well received. So I think it was important to show these photos prior to Sam's um, more sobering account of what's going on in elephants. So you have a better understanding that these are not, as I believed at one time, big, gray, simple animals. They're full of behavior and relationships and passion and intelligence. And once you're around these animals, it's unequivocal. And this was one of my favorite shots. Just this baby is leaning against her mother. And it's just literally just a bit beyond where I am sitting to Sam that this is being revealed to me. What a privilege to see that, to capture that on film. Meanwhile, we're getting covered in mud. <laughs> so, of course, um, mother and baby relationships would have to be part of the book. In Namibia, again, in a very arid environment, in the middle of the heat of the afternoon, everything comes for a drink. And it's, it's pretty amazing to see the variety of animals, but then the elephant comes and everything slightly clears away as they make their entrance. In this environment, the elephants cover themselves in alkali and minerals, and when it dries, they look like ghost creatures. No longer are they gray, but a beautiful white porcelain color. But it's also a great opportunity to show context, to film other animals within the legs of these animals or the trunks. So that was a, a great opportunity in Namibia. We will be, by the way, leading uh, a couple safaris back to Etosha this year. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were in Etosha, and an elephant had died from natural causes, and prides of lions were coming in to feed on it. There was probably somewhere between 30 and 40 uh, jackals, which are uh, small, you know, predatory animals. They were feeding on it, but then these two elephants came, members, obviously to me, of the same family, and they shooed everything away. They stood near the uh, carcass of the elephant for a long time, just touching it with their trunks and then eventually moving on. The connections that the elephants have is pretty obvious, and, it, and there's signs that they come back to the bones of some elephant that's long deceased, but they will play with the bones with their trunks and connect with that family member. I'm not advocating this. This is not necessarily shining a light on my intelligence. This was shot years ago where I, w I went down to a water hole in Savuti Channel and waited for uh, a group of old males that are non-breeders, which means they're fairly simple, they're fairly at ease with humans, but there were still occasions where one or two would come my way and kick sand towards me just to kind of shoo me away. 
But why I was down there that close to these elephants was I wanted to try to abstract them, to sh shoot them in yet a different way. So legs and trunks, I was trying to make them almost appear like a forest rather than a herd of elephants. And at that level, you can shoot through the legs at other animals. Again, these are employing every device I have to bring life to a book. Otherwise, if it's an entire book of just portraits of the same animals, it would pretty much be a very short read. Bisa oryx are one of the more charismatic animals of Namibia. I heard a couple of years ago that there were uh, three orphaned elephants, and I wasn't entirely sure how they became orphaned. Perhaps it was poaching. This was in Botswana, in the famous Okavango Delta. And that two, a husband and wife biologist team kind of took on these elephant uh, offspring and raised them in the wild, fed them, nurtured them, but also allowed them to run free. And these three elephants ra uh, became adults and roamed freely in the natural uh, forest of the Okavango Delta. I found out about it. I went there and I asked them that that pond over there, if I got in that pond up to my neck, could you actually call those elephants out of the wild? And they said, well, um, yeah, maybe we could do that. And I said, more importantly, if I was up to my neck in the water with my camera and you called them into the river or into the pond, could you make them stop? And they said, <laughs> they said, well, we're not sure about that. And I said, okay, good enough, let's try it. So this is the shot. This is with a 16 millimeter wide angle. And that is very close, in other words, the closest animal is a few feet uh, from me, and they were able to stop the elephant, thankfully. Otherwise, there would be no way, honestly, you could get a shot of a wild elephant with a 16 millimeter wide angle with infinite depth of field other than doing that trick. There's been times over the years, and you would imagine this, if I've been to Africa that many times, that you've had very close encounters. I've had elephants fall asleep just outside my tent, and yes, they do snore, and yes, they lay flat as a pancake on their side when they're sleeping. Have you seen that? They snore worse than I do. <laughs> so you wake up, and you kind of stumble out of the tent, and you may be face-to-face -face with an elephant. This is a shot in Chad. It's a country of North Africa, just on the southern end of the Sahara. It's surrounded by unsavory neighbors from the Sudan to the Central African Republic and Nigeria to the west. We went up there for this book because uh, John Jaweep, this renegade, uh, brutal organization of uh, renegades, would come into Chad and poach wild elephants in Zakuma National Park. And what was once a robust herd of elephants was willowed down to about 400 animals. And a normal herd of elephants, maybe 20 or 30, I've seen as many as 40 in one herd, there was 400 elephants in one herd in Chad because they all grouped up safety in numbers. So I went to Chad to photograph a herd of that size, which would remind you of what uh, Africa might have been 50 or 100 years ago. So I went to Chad, and these are some of the photos from that, uh, that sequence. And these elephants are big old boys. They're not used to people. Uh, in fact, two days prior to this, one had trampled somebody on a runway, on the remote runway strip near the headquarters to the park. So we went to the headquarters because we heard there was a little bit of water outside the building and these elephants routinely came in. So we went there to photograph these big guys coming into the water hole. And I turned on a hose and was hol holding a hose and a big elephant came up and put its trunk right into the end of the hose. So I was like watering the elephants. But I was on the veranda, there was like a covered, there was no way they could get to me. So I was standing, you know, 10 feet away with the hose going out. This is a little uh, dicey. This was down in Zimbabwe. I, had photogra I was photographing this mother that had a baby, 
and I was talking fairly loud so I knew I was there and suddenly I walked out beyond a fallen log and my profile was really exposed at which time this mother came charging at me and these are the shots I ran quickly back behind the, tr uh, the log and it struck the log with such force that it sheared off a very thick branch that went flying over in my head. And the immediate thought that I had that was this animal was outside of the park at some time in its history and had a very negative altercation with humans because its reaction was so fast. And it was stunning to me because I've been around a lot of elephants that seem fairly chill. This one was not so chill. So elephants t uh, tend to herd up in circles, uh, especially breeding herds. They protect their babies. These are photos of elephants near Chobe National Park uh, in the fall, in August, September. You have a lot of burning uh, fields hundreds of miles away, but it results in beautiful sunsets nonetheless. Um, a fellow Seattleite, um, Paul Allen, put a lot of money into Chad, uh, equipped the rangers with uh, technology, um, and you know all about that. And these are some of the shots of Paul Allen's uh, contributions to African parks. And they were able to track that herd of 400 that I alluded to minutes ago. And they, um, he also hired the Black Mambas, equipped them with automatic rifles. And poaching basically came to a stop. And so much so that by the time I got there, the herd of 400 were having a lot of babies. And the year after I left, they were starting to break up into smaller, nat more natural families. But these were shots that I gave to the park, and they would scrutinize all the photos and count the babies. And elephants were coming back in this beautiful national park in Chad. And photos that I had grown up watching uh, Peter Beard's work, a uh, photographer that did a lot of great work in East Africa, you know, 20 years before I ever picked up a camera. These are photos that are very similar to what I saw he had shot earlier in the century. Simply put, and uh, Sam will reiterate this, it's just unfathomable to me that we could live at a time where we put man on the moon, can we not save this most charismatic of animals? You know, what a tragedy it would be to live at a time that we know what elephants are, but they would disappear from the face of the planet. Sam, pick it up from here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was marvelous. I think we should all go home now. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, doom and gloom than um, what um, Art described. And it was actually kind of a challenge writing the text for this book because Art's photos are so beautiful, and I had such a harsh story to tell. And then I realized that, you know, it's really important to see how spectacular of animals these elephants are so that you can fully appreciate what's happening to them. And part of this is that elephants are incredibly intelligent. They, they have the largest brain of any land mammal. And if you, there have been a number of cognitive tests that they've, they've done on elephants. So for example, they can recognize themselves in a mirror. And not many animals are able to do that. But not only can they recognize themselves in the mirror, if you take chalk and you put it on the elephant's forehead, it'll take its trunk and it'll go, what is that? And it'll rub it off. And that's vanity. That's something that only <laughs> great apes and people have. Um, they also have, have looked at um, the genes in elephants for energy metabolism in the brain, and they found that they have a higher density of those genes than do people. And if you have an active brain, you need energy. So all of this talks about how incredibly smart elephants are, and that's very, very important to think about when you consider what's happening to them. Also, Art did a beautiful job talking about how social these elephants are. They, they are, family is so important to these animals. They, when, when you see them in a place like this, where they're playing in a, in a river course, they'll play there for hours, and you'll have little babies in there with full adults rolling all over each other, and nothing happens to them. They're, they're so carefully monitoring the babies, and the sisters, whenever there's a problem, the sisters will run in and take care of them. So family is incredibly important to these animals. 
As Art mentioned, they also are very, very aware of death. And during the 20 years that I was running a field site in southern Tanzania, when a lot of the poaching was at its peak, we would collect skulls from elephants and bring them back to our camp to age them. And we had skulls of other species too. And the elephants would come through at night and they would just take their trunks and inspect every single inch of the elephant bones and skulls. And then they would just go right over the giraffe and the buffalo. They, they didn't even care about it. And I, it's funny, this uh, last year I was on sabbatical and I was in uh, Samburu National Park where a um, very famous area called, uh, where Save the Elephants uh, is um, uh, underway. And, and at that field site, they had radio collars on all of these elephants that they used to monitor them. And they had the old radio collars lined up on a post uh, that have come off of elephants that either died or, or um, the battery needed to be replaced. And in the evening, the elephants would come and they would smell each one of the collars and then they'd go, oh, I know this guy. And they'd pick it up and walk away with it. <laughs> so it's pretty remarkable how aware these elephants are. They're intelligent, family matters. They're so aware of death. And so you can imagine when something like this happens, when a baby's mother is poached right there and its face hacked off and the rest of the group is sitting there. These elephants get PTSD. And it's not surprising, they're smart. They love family, they understand death. And here, this kind of travesty is going on. And this is really what compelled me to do the kind of work that, that I do. So when you think about all this, and then you think about, well, how many elephants are being killed? Well, remarkably, there are 40,000 elephants being killed each year by poachers. And there's only 400,000 elephants left in Africa. So that's 10% of the population being killed in a year. And this is a serious problem. And what it means is that we really need to stop the killing. We need to figure out how do we put this thing to rest. And that is really what the primary focus of my work um, is up to. When you look at the scale of this problem, you see that this is a transnational organized crime. It's the, the illegal wildlife trade is the fourth to fifth largest transnational um, crime in the world. That means that it's up there with narcotics trafficking, human trafficking, cyber crime, um, you, you name it. And, and so it is quite a serious problem. It's worth about $20 billion a year, the illegal wildlife trade. And ivory, the ivory trade is about $4 billion of that trade. So how did it get so bad? And believe it or not, the reason that it got so bad is from this. The ships that you see in the ports across Seattle carrying these containers are incredibly important for commerce. And transnational criminals of all types, not just wildlife um, traffickers, have capitalized on this because there are one billion containers moving around the world each year. And that means that customs and even the most sophisticated ports can afford, can, can, are able to inspect about one to two percent of these containers. So that means that all you have to do if you're a transnational criminal is get your product containerized and get it past customs and there is a very, very low probability that your container will get caught. And some of these, these seizures, the, the, the minimum value of the seizure that we look at in this work is about a million dollars. It's seizures that are at least a half a ton, 500 kilos worth of ivory. And so you could imagine these are traffickers that can actually afford to lose a million dollars if someone catches their, their shipment. Well, how is that? Well, chances are they got 20 more shipments through. And so that's really been the challenge is when you've got all of this, this, this trafficking going on and you just got to get it past customs, which you can easily pay a customs official off, how do you deal with this problem? And so what we tried to do was to develop ways of getting intelligence information on how these transnational criminals are operating so that we can attack the trade and keep it from getting into transit. Because once it's in transit, it's just pretty much a lost cause. And so that's really the main focus of our work. To do this, we try to figure out what is the source of the ivory, where is it all being poached, and who's exporting this ivory. And so how do you do this? Well, one of the things that we um, 
tried to do is to get a genetic map. We developed a genetic map of elephants across the whole continent of Africa. And essentially, this, we did this by using elephant dung, their poop. In fact, I have poop from every place that Art talked about in um, here. We have samples from over 3,000 elephants, and each one of them we get DNA from, and a large different amounts of DNA, the same kinds of DNA that the FBI uses to track criminals in their criminal database. And we've essentially made a map of African elephants for forest elephants, which are a separate species from savanna elephants. And um, we, we, so we have maps for forest elephants, for savanna elephants. And then when there's a big ivory seizure, and this is ivory seizures that are uh, so when I say a seizure, by the way, I'm meaning you seize the ivory as opposed to the ivory had a seizure. Um, so when we take these seizures and we take the tusks out and we get the same DNA from those tusks, we can actually map it to our DNA map and we can tell where a tusk came from to within 180 miles of its true origin. And when you consider you can put five United States in Africa, that's a very, very high precision. So we started looking at all these large ivory seizures. Again, it had to be a minimum of a half a ton of ivory, and 70% of ivory seizures are a half a ton or more. And those are ivory that those are seizures that are worth a minimum of a million dollars. So these are the transnational criminals that are doing the most amount of damage to the population. And when we did that, and we started to accumulate seizure after seizure, we started to see the same places popping up over and over again in terms of where the ivory was being poached from. And indeed, uh, the, the other challenge that we had to do, had was, to, how do you sample these seizures? So some of these ivory seizures have 2,000 or more tusks in it, and it costs a lot of money to analyze tusks. It's about $100 a tusk to get a full genotype on them. So we had to figure out a way to representatively subsample the ivory. And the first thing that we did was we would measure the diameter of the tusk at the base where it leaves the jaw, like you can see here. And that's very symmetrical between the two tusks. And once we did that, we would then lay all the tusks out from the smallest diameter to the largest. And what that does is it makes it likely that the tusk is next to um, something, next to its, its other pair, the other tusk in the pair. But still, it could be, uh, there, there are plenty of other tusks that are going to be the same size. So then we walk along all the tusks, and we try to find one ones that are the same color and make sure that they're next to each other. Because if you look at the pairs that you see here, uh, this tusk right here that's orange, there's no way it's a pair to that tusk that's white. So you move it around so that you're next to the tusk of the same color. And then the last thing you do is you look for this gum line right here. That's where the tusk leaves the lip of the elephant. And that's perfectly symmetrical in the two tusks. So once you have aligned all those out, then you can see who the pairs are and you put one aside so you don't analyze the same animal twice. Now that's going to become important to the story a little bit later. So once we've done that, we then randomly take about 200 tusks out, we cut a little square out of the base of the tusk, and then we take that back to our lab. And then that square, we get most of the DNA is at the bottom level there, so we cut that off and we put it into um, a machine into a, a machine that has liquid nitrogen and gets the ivory brittle cold. It, it freezes it to about minus 250 degrees Celsius. And then you have a magnet inside the tube where the ivory is, and you shift that magnetic field back and forth about 10 times a second, and it comes out a consistency of baby powder, like you see here. And then we can extract the DNA and compare that to our map. So that's kind of the, how we go about doing this work. And when we did this, we kept analyzing seizure after seizure after seizure, and we were shocked to find that virtually 100% of these large seizures that we were getting was coming from just two places in Africa. 78% of the ivory was from savanna elephants and was coming from East Africa, an area focused largely on Tanzania, but going from southern Mozambique, um, he, from uh, southern Mozambique um, up through Tanzania into uh, uh, northern um, Africa. So, so this was a very important finding because essentially poaching is going on all over Africa, but we were able to show that it's consistently these big transnational criminals are working largely in these two places. And I'm very, very proud to say that we kept 
going back to the United Nations and other, other entities and saying, look at what's going on here over and over again. And this year, for the first time, poaching in East Africa has significantly declined. And it's largely because of this work and work with others like me. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Well, we noticed another thing when we looked at these seizures, because we could tell from the, the shipping manifest where the ivory actually left Africa. And one of the things that we saw was that the ivory is almost always exported out of a different country from where it's poached. Essentially, it's a risk reduction strategy that these, the, the big traffickers that are moving the ivory, they're in a different country, so if you catch the poacher, they can't finger the, the, the dealer. And so the question then became, well, well, how does all this ivory get there? Because poachers, they're on foot. And so they only can poach the amount, enough ivory that they can carry. And what we then realized is that essentially you have a system where you've got many, many different poachers operating in an area, in many different areas, but within a big protected area. And essentially these guys, as they get their ivory, middlemen come up and they come in and they buy the ivory from these poachers. And once they have the ivory, they then move it up to the neighboring country where it gets consolidated. So for example, this middle, these middlemen will commonly move the ivory from southern Tanzania up to the port of Mombasa that you see there. Um, but sometimes, after a while, the port of Mombasa got too hot because too much ivory was going out of that area. So then they shifted to move it up to uh, Entebbe, Uganda, that you see there. And in Tebe, is, um, they don't have nearly as many elephants in that part of Africa. And also, it's not a, war, a seaport. So who would suspect that ivory is going to be moved out from there? But then, once it's in a container and they move it to Mombasa to send it out again, now it's already in transit. So Mombasa doesn't have to worry about it anymore, and it goes out. And what's interesting is that we find that in most cases, um, this is all going to one major transnational criminal organization. So that's a really important finding because essentially it's saying that, you know, there's these big traffickers moving out multiple tons of ivory, there's not a lot of them, and if we can find them, these are the guys doing the most amount of damage, then we can really start to do, have some impact. And when we did, um, one of the things also, sorry, that's very, very important about this is that, so, so you imagine this ivory is moving from the poachers through the middlemen up to these ports of export. But I said that they're poaching the same areas for years and years and years. And one of the things that we have been able to discover is that these same transnational criminal organizations have been operating in this area for this entire time. And they are essentially the money that is fueling these poachers. They are providing the ability for these poachers to keep doing what they do in these same hot spots because they're providing the bullets for them to kill the elephants and the whole network to move the ivory up to their coffers. Hmm. Well, when we uh, started to realize how important it was to be able to get these transnational criminals and trying to figure out how could we do this, we then had a breakthrough. So you remember I talked about matching the pairs of tusks in these seizures. We were sampling the tusks in these large seizures, and one of the things that we noticed was that over half of the tusks didn't have a pair. Only one of the two tusks from the elephant was in the seizure. And we thought, what is going on? Where is the other tusk? So what we decided to do was to see, well, by this time we had over 60 large ivory seizures in our lab. And we thought, well, maybe the tusk from the other tusk from the elephant is in another seizure. And we started to look between seizures. And literally, it took us about two hours to get the result. And we found numerous matches where the two tusks from the same elephants were essentially shipped in separate seizures. And essentially, what was happening, we realized, is that when this ivory was moving from the poachers through the middleman up to the transnational criminal organization, the tusks get separated. So maybe the poacher the two poachers are, are, are working together. They get a big elephant and a medium-sized elephant. They say, you take a big tusk and a medium-sized tusk. I'll do the same. Or maybe this middleman didn't have enough money to buy all the tusks. Whatever it happened, very frequently they get separated. But because you've got this one big transnational criminal organization driving this whole thing, those two tusks still end up to, at the same guy's place 
just at different times often, and then they get shipped in separate shipments. And by genetically matching the two tusks, we were able to link individual traffickers to multiple shipments and so see how big of a trafficker are they and how connected are they to other traffickers. Like is the, the trafficker moving ivory out of Mombasa, is he connected to the trafficker in, in Uganda? Yes. And then the most exciting thing happened that we um, were able to put down the biggest and most notorious ivory trafficker in Africa. This is Faisal Muhammad Ali, who we, working with the Kenya government, the director, Directorate of um, Criminal Investigation, we got him convicted for 20 years. He was part of this bigger network. Um, these guys here, the Akasha brothers, were moving heroin and meth to the United States. And um, they started to brag about moving ivory, and um, they were able to connect him to Faisal. And then the DEA, who was looking after, who was trying to get the Akasha brothers, started to use all the networks that we had established with the elephants because we can track them because their genetics separate their populations and tell them how these guys were moving all of their, uh, their other ty types of material, in this case narcotics, and they actually used our evidence to extradite them to the United States. They're now in the same prison as El Chapo right down the hall. So, that was really exciting. And then Faisal got acquitted. He was in prison, prison after just two years, and he got out. We were horrified. And he got out because there were so many irregularities. So you're dealing with the, these, so much corruption in this case. Just to, to give you an example, so they, the, the ivory that Faisal was, in the seizure that Faisal was convicted for, was in a big warehouse, the, the biggest automotive warehouse in Kenya. And um, when they, they had in there the vehicles that moved the ivory, and, and um, uh, when they went to go inspect the evidence, the vehicles that were there were stolen. So that was one bit of evidence that, that was missing. Um, some of the seizures that we had also connected him to got stolen out of customs. And then the magistrate decided that they wanted to take the prosecution to visit the crime scene. They got there, and the biggest automotive dealership in Kenya was leveled to the ground. No evidence. So you could see how vulnerable this case became because they tried him on only one case, and that was the big mistake that they made. Um, so what, this is a little bit complicated. Don't get lost in the complication. Essentially, each one of these figures is, is a, is, shows you a, a seizure that we had. Um, so, and and um, what I really want you to see, so these are all different seizures, where they were made and when. And what I want you to notice is when there are arrows connecting them. When there are arrows connecting them, that means that the two tusks from the same elephant were in, were in two separate seizures. There was a tusk in here from the same elephant as, and in there. And so that's how we link them all. And you can see all of these are connected. The, this whole network here is all Faisal. We connected them to 11 different ivory seizures. But what's interesting is these ones down here, these were all ones that there's no arrows connecting them. And we expected that there should be arrows there because, because they all come from the same ports, which is what these solid uh, circles are showing you. You can see they're all coming from the same port. Same ones as up here, too. And you can see that where the ivory came from is very similar to where the ivory came from here. They were all close in time, but there weren't matches. And we realized that the problem is that we're probably missing a lot of these matches. Because you imagine, you've got these two tusks from the same incident, the same animal being killed. They've got to get separated. They've got to end up with the same guy. They've got to be shipped in separate seizures. Then we have to get access to those two seizures and sample them. And we can only afford to sample about 30% of the tusks from each of those shipments, which means that you have a 30% of 30% chance of getting both pieces in your lab to even match, a 9% chance. Well, many, many matches are missed. And what was a problem was that this is the seizure that Faisal was tried for. 
These are the two seizures that were stolen. Um, and because he was, Faisal was tried for this only one seizure, that left the whole case incredibly vulnerable, and it fell apart, and he got acquitted. Well, we then realized that there may be a better way. And when you're doing this kind of work, it's kind of like an arms race, where you've got to stay one step ahead of these transnational criminals. And what we realized is that we could actually take advantage of the fact that female elephants stay in the same family group throughout life. So we realized that we could do what we call um, familial matching, where essentially we take the tusks from parents and offspring and full siblings and half siblings, so just really, really close relatives, and to match their tusks between different shipments. And this is actually a tool that has started to get a lot of attention actually in the human forensic world. It's a bit controversial, but essentially, you know, if you get DNA from a crime scene and you match it to the FBI's criminal database and you find it's not a perfect match, but it's a very close match, chances are it's a close relative because crime runs in families. And then you can look at the genetics of these other relatives and you can, you can, um, hopefully find your perpetrator. And some very, very serious mass murders have been caught this way. Um, again, it's very controversial, but for elephants it's not controversial at all because it's, it's, it's really an issue of looking at are there relatives found in these separate shipments? And when we did that, we found a huge number of matches because if you think about it, so you've got one elephant, well, he's got f two parents, so that's four tusks that hits two tusks can match to already. Then he's got all his sisters, and, and then you've got, within an area of 100,000 square kilometers where they're poaching, there's all those other families just like that, so if they keep going back to these same areas over and over again, there's lots of opportunities to do this familial matching. So what we did was we took every single tusk that we had genotyped in our lab. There was about 7,000 of them distributed from 65 large seizures, and we compared every single tusk to the other tusk. That's 50 million comparisons that we made. And we looked to see, did, did they cluster in a certain way? And we created these heat maps that you can see here that essentially show us how much matching there are. So this, is, this key right here is saying how many matches of parent offspring, full siblings, and half siblings you get. And you can see a really dark square like that means that there are 60 familial matches in this seizure right here that match this seizure down here. Or essentially, these, th this is uh, all the names here are the same as the names here. So essentially, this seizure here has, has almost 60 matches to familiar matches to that seizure. But what's really important about this is if you look here, there's a square here that's all darkened, okay? And those are all where all the familial matches are clustered. Well, let's look a little deeper there. And so remember this, this um, network that I showed you. And essentially, when we looked there, we found that this is the seizure in blue that uh, is Faisal right here. You can see this line, and we connected him now not to 11 seizures, which was the case before, now to 35 seizures. And when we looked at all the other different seizures one at a time, we see that this seizure here, which is the most common one, made in, uh, most, has the most matches, and we're going to go from most common to the least. And you can see that when I uh, highlight it in blue, I'm showing you also where it was on this map. And as you go down, you can see that Every time we get a, we got so many different matches here, familial matches in that whole network, including ones that we didn't get matches before, and you go through and essentially we hit every single savanna elephant match uh, seizure that we thought was in this network. We match them all to each other. So now we're building a very, very strong case against Faisal. Now you may say, but Faisal was already acquitted. So what difference does it make? Well, fortunately, Kenya does not have a statute of limitations, which means we can retry him for these. And we've learned our lesson. So this time, we are making a solid case that we can really win over. And what's very important about this is our primary collaborator in this is US Homeland Security Investigations. 
So Homeland Security investigations, that's part of Homeland Security. They're not the ones doing the immigration part. Um, they're really out to get transnational criminals. There's 250 agents around the world. And what's really wonderful about these collaborators is that they have unique authority to get into the financial records of these criminals. So they're the only agency in the United States that can actually go through, and as long as there's some exchange using U.S. currency, they can get deep into the financial records, and now we can bring down someone like Faisal for financial crimes, just like Al Capone was brought down for, for um, tax fraud. And that's what we're doing, because essentially all of these connections that we are creating by linking these seizures to one another, we know where it came from, we know where the shipping routes went from the shipping manifest, and we know that all these different shipments are all part of this bigger network, so we are creating this roadmap for financial crime investigations so that when Faisal goes back to, prison, goes back to court, we will hopefully get him on a corruption-proof uh, sentence. And what happened right when Faisal was put into prison, we started to see a new modus operandi of these traffickers. And what was happening was that the poachers were, the, the traffickers were taking teak logs. Now teak, you know, is very expensive wood. And they were hollowing it out. And then they were cutting this tusk into sections and they were putting it inside the hollow teak logs, embedding it into paraffin, and then sealing the logs so that you couldn't tell that there was anything in it. And the reason they did that is if you x-ray it, it would look solid. And so someone was putting a lot of money into trying to conceal their ivory um, to, to figure out a new way of getting their, their ivory through um, uh, to their, their final destination. So we had three of these cases here immediately. This one seized in Vietnam that went through Uganda. This uh, middle one uh, that, that started in Mozambique, it was seized in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, but it went through Uganda where it was likely packed. And this other one that uh, went from Uganda through Mombasa, and um, again, um, all of them in this paraffin. And then, we got a seizure in West Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire, in the Ivory Coast. Same modus operandi. And all of a sudden we went, wow, we're dealing with a much bigger network. We're now connecting East Africa and West Africa. And these pictures, believe it or not, are from the trafficker's cell phone. <laughs> he photographed everything. And so you can see here, he was actually, this is in his house, where he was actually hollowing out the logs and packing them. So you can see here the hollowed logs. He's got the ivory cut into sections where he lays it in there. And then they seal it with the paraffin, put the logs on. Those are the finished product right there. It's unbelievable. Can you tell? And then they go and they, it's in these containers. And when you open up the containers, we could see how they packed it. They, these are those logs that you saw in his house. And then they go and they push, so these have the ivory, they push them to the back, and then they take these pallets of thinner boards here, and they put them, they load them into the truck, and then they snip the cables that held the pallets together. So if you x-ray it and you see that the ivory is in there, you have to pull out one board at a time, and most of the customs people go, I'm not going to go there. And so it's quite clever how these guys are operating. And when we started to look at this whole network, these are the first three ones in hollowed logs that I talked about. And I just want to show you how many of them we connected. Here's another one in South Sudan, another one in Uganda. We found two tusks that were an identical match from the Sudan and Uganda seizures. Um, and then um, this uh, seizure here, they were monitoring the cell phones of, this, of these guys when they caught them. And they, they learned about another seizure in Nairobi. By the way, Faisal's in prison now. And, but not, not right now, at the time, this is, now oh. he's walking free, so <laughs> take that back. But what was interesting was the cell phones led them to another ivory seizure that was sitting in Nairobi here, and they went and they caught it, and as soon as these guys got picked up and put in, into jail, they called Faisal in prison to say, what do we do? So that means we have connected Faisal to this whole network now. We're building this case into the future. And then we have these shipments that started occurring all over the rest of Africa, in Hong Kong, in Cambodia, in Cote d'Ivoire, um, in, uh, in Singapore, 
and um, lots of connections made between all these seizures in terms of sharing tusks and um, just the same tusks from the same individual. And then when we went back and looked at the heat maps, we actually linked all these new tusks together from the familial matching. So we're connecting this whole network of both East Africa and West Africa together, and we are now doing all the financial investigations into these guys to hopefully bring down not only Faisal, but this big international network that is operating out of Vietnam. So we have great collaborators, um, um, and, and it's really, you know, I've been doing this work since 2004, and I've worked with a lot of different law enforcement agencies, and what has really been spectacular for me is that these agents working for Homeland Security Investigations, they get the power of the data of what we're doing, and it's a really, really a give and take uh, um, investigation into this. I'm on the phone with them almost every day in Africa, and we are building this case more and more so that we can essentially connect this whole network together with the financial crime investigations needed to bring them down. Um, I just want to say that this is a lot of people help me. This is uh, people in my lab that are wonderful, and, and other um, uh, people that I work with um, uh, in, in this whole project. It takes a village to do this work. And we also get a lot of support from the Department of State, uh, Department of uh, Justice, National Institute of Justice, um, um, just a wide variety of people that is really, really um, important. And many, many countries work with us in this. And it took a long time to build this trust. You imagine, I mean, getting ivory out of South Sudan, Cam Cambodia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, getting these countries to actually share them with me as a university faculty member is somewhat of a challenge. And over time, we've built this trust so that we now have a fantastic network of trust. And I just want to end by saying that this work is really, really expensive. It costs about $29,000 to analyze one single seizure. And one of the challenges is that we face is that countries will never give us the ivory if we ask them to pay for it. So the way that we operate is I go to these agencies and donors ahead of time and I get the money so that it's sitting there in our university budget and as soon as an ivory seizure is made, I just go to the country and I say, just give us the samples, we will analyze it for free and we will give you back the data within one month. And that's what we really aim to do. So one of the things that I want to just say is that if any of you can help, give whatever money you can to this. It doesn't have to be $29,000, although I would love it if it was. Um, <laughs> but you can give just a little bit. And, and to, this is all going to go help pay for these ivory seizures so that we can continue this fight. We have 12 seizures waiting to come in right now. I'm leaving in two weeks to Thailand to do two seizures and then Singapore to do a seizure that actually has nine tons of ivory, one seizure, you can imagine. So um, you can just go to www.giving.uw.edu ivory. So www giving University of Washington Education um, so forward slash ivory. Or if you want more information, there's a lot of things that I just went over very, very quickly. I'm happy to give you more details. I love to talk, and I love to talk about this work. And so if you really want more information, go to my um, admin person, Keely Wolfram. So Wolfram. K. Wolf Ram at universitywashington.edu, and uh, she'll be happy to help you. And I uh, thank you all for listening and <laughs> taking place. Okay. okay. Thank you for being such a, an attentive audience. Go ahead. Uh, years ago, a biologist that did uh, research at the Serengeti talked about. Uh, breeding elephants somehow so they no longer had tusks, and that that seemed to reduce their being predated on or uh, poached. Um, I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about that. So um, it's not true. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, the, a lot of people have suggested that, um, to cut off the tusks of the elephants. Um, but the, there are some that have that are no longer have tusks because they had better survivorship without tusks. Is that what you were asking me? Yeah. Yes. So that is the case, um, and uh, there still um, are plenty of far more animals, elephants with tusks 
than without. But one of the, we did a study where I was working and we found that 45% um, uh, of the juveniles uh, that were born had TUS and 15% of the adults had TUS. So that means that if you were born um, it, without a tusk, you are much more likely to make it to adulthood than if you're born with one. Okay, and, step. Okay, next. Sorry, thank you. Okay, so you've talked a lot about money. Can you talk about how Bitcoin has been involved in ivory poaching and financial transactions? Because it's really difficult to track Bitcoin. Yes, and that's that. Um, we're, if my colleagues were here, they could answer that. I I can't, but I can say that it is certainly part of the exchange process. Okay, next. Thanks, both of you. I'm curious. Uh, you mentioned sort of final destination of what you told us tonight, it's Vietnam. Or, but isn't China really one of the main final destinations? Or what happens when the ivory gets to Vietnam or? Yeah, Elsewhere. so um, I mentioned Vietnam because they get more ivory going through there than any other country in the world. In the last five years, they had 45 tons of ivory go through Vietnam. The second most common one is Hong Kong, and that was just 35 tons. And, but most of this ivory goes into China. The, the, um, but China is very, very good at protecting their borders, so they move it into these neighboring countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Myanmar, and then they walk it across. Um, but over the years, these big traffickers operating in Vietnam and other places, they've made a lot of money, and now they're starting to be their own investors. And that's really important because most of these seizures that we get are whole tusks. They're not the little trinkets that you see in the market. And actually what happens is these big investors are buying up these whole tusks, and they're keeping them. And they're stashing them like an investment. And they're banking on elephants going extinct, so then it'll become legal to sell ivory and they'll have it all. That's just horrific. So yeah, China is very important. US also is a very big market. Um, we have been in the past, but most of it's smuggled in here. And it's largely because hunters buy ivory. They smuggle in small bits of ivory from China, and they cut it into the handles of their guns and their knives. And you may know that President Obama tried to, um, when, when he, made, uh, he, he banned ivory sales here, his hardest fight was with the National Rifle Association, and that was because they said, ah, this is just an excuse to prevent us from selling our, our weapons. Richard? Dr. Wasser, um, you focused your presentation mostly on demand, and you were just starting to brush in the area I was concerned about, which is supply, uh, uh, or the reverse. Um, is, is there anything being done to reduce the demand, not only for ivory, but I saw you mentioned rhino horn and pangolin scales and things of that nature. Um, I know that a lot of those are just simply supposed aphrodisiacs and things like that. Is there a way to reduce the demand for, these, for some of these products? Because then it makes it unprofitable for these syndicates to continue. That's a great question. And there are... There are, there are um, National, there are, there are groups that are spending millions of dollars to try to reduce demand, making fantastic videos for people to, to understand don't buy ivory. People in China, most people buying ivory, they don't even know, you realize you have to kill the elephant to get the tusk. And so shrinking demand is extremely important, but that is a long-term solution. We need an urgent solution, too. When we're losing 40,000 elephants a year, if we think that we're going to stop this problem by curbing demand, that's just not going to happen. We have to do both. And as soon as they start seeing that the demand is going down really quickly, what's going to happen is these poachers are going to kill every last elephant they can so that they can essentially uh, sell their ivory before the demand goes away. OK, three uh, quick questions. I see people leaving with their books. We have to sign. If people have bought books, go ahead, please. Hi, Dr. Sam. Hi, Sister um, Sarah. Hi. Um, can you give me some perspective on your 40,000 elephants that are being poached every year or killed every year? So take that, that $1 million unit that you were talking about. How many elephants does that represent? If that's a, that's a container, right? That's so, a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. I, I could have even asked you to ask that. So how do we figure out that there's 40,000 elephants killed? Well, on average, each tusk weighs about five kilograms. So that means two tusks weigh 10 kilograms. So 
So 10 kilograms of ivory is one elephant. They are seizing about 40,000 kilograms a year, but that's 10% of what's smuggled. So the calculation then becomes one kilogram of ivory is equivalent to one elephant killed. Kilograms. So that's how you get that. Kilograms or kilogram? Kilogram, a kilogram, 2.2 pounds of ivory is equivalent and is equivalent to one elephant. Go ahead. Hi, so my question kind of dovetails on the question about demand. Um, is there any reason, um, and if so, if you can explain why we can't um, just flood the market with 3D printed fake ivory tusks and, you know, just fake them all out? Because poaching is, is that's, that's, a, that's a lot of work. Um, you know, uh, the mammoth tusk that's in like Siberia when the permafrost melts, is there, is there a way to just fake it? We make lab-grown um, diamonds. It's very, very hard because, because um, first of all, nobody has really been able to, to, to synthesize a tusk very well. They have rhino horn, actually. But, but people really want the real deal. And the other thing is that, is that, as I mentioned before, once you start flooding the market, the, the whole idea is that if you can flood the market, the price will go down, incentives to poach will go down. But these poachers, and especially the major traffickers, they are going to go and they are going to wipe out as many elephants as they can as quickly as they can so that they can make their profit before the elephants go away. And uh, so those kinds of solutions, this, they, they, they are ones that make us feel good, like we're trying to do something about it. But what we really need to do is we need to stop them from killing the elephants and we need to get the main um, traffickers that are moving this ivory and put them away. Sorry, there were four people waiting. I was just sitting. Um, I wanted to ask about The Last Animals, this phenomenal documentary, which I'll plug real quick. Go on YouTube and watch the trailer. The film is called The Last Animals, and I was wondering if it's going to be playing anytime in Seattle. Thank you. Oh, that's great. So The Last Animals is a film by Kate Brooks on my work and others. Um, it is, it's uh, from National Geographic, bought the film, and it's now on Hulu. So if you go on Hulu, you can see The Last Animals, and it's a, a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Um, and I highly recommend it, not that I'm biased. <laughs> Thank you for your work, Alan. Um, why, you see these um, pictures of large piles of tusks being burned and destroyed. Why is that a good idea? Why do they take them off the market because of, from a supply and demand standpoint? Well, for one thing, uh, it's, giving, it's showing people that a country that doesn't have a lot of money is still saying that this is devastating our country, this trade is so bad that we are just going to destroy all of our ivory because it's a bigger issue. So it sends a really important message to do that. So, but, but that's not the only reason. The other reason that it's important is that countries, um, when they get ivory seizures, they, they stockpile it. So they get a stockpile and, and they're also in these countries with elephants that are dying naturally. The only ivory that you are allowed to sell by the United Nations regulations are ivory that di from elephants that died naturally in your country. Because if you make a seizure, you can't prove it came from your country, so you have no right to sell it. So why are these countries keeping you know, hundreds of tons, or, or tens of tons, and sometimes up to 100 tons of, of ivory, when they can't even sell it? It gets re-smuggled. And so you want to get rid of it. You want to get rid of it, and at the same time, you want the world to understand that elephants are worth much more alive than dead. And so we just want to get rid of all the tusks and essentially stop all future trade in elephants with no chance of new ivory getting on the market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent.